Hello and welcome to today's 36th webinar in the E360 webinar series, Future Refrigeration Architectures for Meeting Refrigerant Regulations, brought to you by Emerson. I'm Amanda Rogers and I'm your moderator today. We have a few announcements before we begin. Please note that this presentation's audio is provided by phone or through your computer sound system. If you'd like to revisit key sections of today's webinar, it will be available on demand at climate.emerson.com slash E360 webinars a few days after this live event. You'll also receive an email in the next few days with a link to the recorded event. Discussing today's topic will be Andre Patnode and Diego Marathon. Andre Patnode is responsible for supporting system-related innovation and leveraging Emerson's global code chain to drive adoption of integrated solutions in North America. He most recently led marketing efforts pertaining to Emerson's food retail and chiller markets. Prior to that, he had managed Emerson's global CO2 development. Andre has more than 35 years of indu industry experience in sales, marketing, training, and business development of HVACR system architectures and applications with compression and component technologies. He is a certified mechanical engineering technologist since 1894 and is a member of ASHRAE, RSES, and OACETT. Diego Marathon is responsible for the Refrigeration Scroll product platform offered to food service, food retail, and transportation markets. He heads new product development, life cycle, and commercialization programs for the platform's top and bottom line growth. He also leads broader strategies for cold chain products and services with the integration of refrigeration, compression, electronics, and data management technologies into optimized solutions. Diego has 10 years of experience in the cold chain industry in engineering, supply chain, product management, marketing, business development, and sales. He has been a part of Emerson team since 2017. Previously, he worked for Embraco as a consultant for technology startups incubated at the Austin Technology Incubator. The webinar will now begin. Andre? Thanks, Amanda. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for joining today and uh, choosing to spend the next hour with us. Um, I've got an agenda here. Before I get started into the agenda, I just wanted to make sure that uh, we're, all, we're all on the same page here because I think we all know that you know, transitions to low GW refrigerants are really on the way in our industry. And it doesn't matter, I suppose, if you're an operator, a consulting engineer, an OEM, wholesaler, or contractor who operate in, in the States or in Canada or any other place, you, you may be, um, have legally mandated reasons to, to switch systems to lower GWP options, or you may be doing it for sustainability goals if, if someone has sustainability goals within an operation. Regardless of the reasons, you know, there's a lot of different options to evaluate. Some of the things we want to try to cover today are part of that. And, you know, sustainability, environmental sustainability is obviously part of all this. And even within that, there's operating factors, um, initial investment factors, uh, maintenance factors that, that all get into that decision-making process. Uh, and, and what's really interesting when we start looking at various architectures and sustainability options is that um, a lot of manufacturers and uh, suppliers are looking at different ways of trying to achieve these goals. And, and, and stakeholders are finding, um, looking at different types of architectures, types, and combining them to try to meet these end goals. And what I'm going to try to do today is basically dovetail myself and Diego Marathon, dovetail from the uh, presentation that Rajan and Jennifer Butch had done on March the 31st on refrigerant regulations. And this is kind of a follow-up, what's the next step as far as equipment perspective? So we're going to take a, a second to look at a few of the regulations and how they're impacting us. Um, factors on equipment selection. So what, what are end users really um, 
some of the uh, selection criteria that important to them. So we'll talk about that, and then we'll look at some of the different decentralized and distributed architectures that you see on the screen here. We'll break those down uh, individually. So from a regulations perspective, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, obviously, but from, from a high-level recap perspective, uh, there's a lot of things going on around the world. These are only three different regions. Canada, uh, you can see, has already started um, in 2020. Centralized systems below 2200 GWP have already started. Uh, in the FGAS regulations, they've started using lower GWP refrigerants. And come 2022, uh, they'll have a less than 150 GWP uh, restriction to on equipment greater than 11.3 tons from a centralized perspective. And even in, in California, uh, the EPA SNAP Rule 20 and 21 started in 2019. Now, SNAP 20, even though I don't have you know, a slide on that, it was covered last session, was published in 2015. Um, basically supposed to, st to start in 2017, um, but it really didn't take form because of uh, a, uh, a Mexican lawsuit. But uh, EPA saw the value in the EPA SNAP ruling that was originally announced in that you had different re refrigerants per applications that were allowed, and when you look at that list, they all tend to be below 1,500 GWP choices. So that's one step that they've already done. But as you look to California in 2022, um, and there's a board meeting January, July 23rd, 24th, um, to, uh, to vote on those proposals. But really what we're looking at is greater than 50 pounds um, systems must have a GWP refrigerants of less than 150. And really, if, if you're below 50 pounds, uh, then you refer back to SNAP 20 and 21, the refrigerant options that are contained in there, and take a look at what is available to you. Now, from an air conditioning perspective, split residential split and rooftop units by 2023, the GWP limit will be less than 750. And if we move out to 2024, chillers, air conditioning, industrial process, Anything above minus 15 Fahrenheit SST falls within the less than 5, 750 GWP range. And if you're below minus, between minus 58 Fahrenheit and minus 15, then the GW limit is a little bit higher. So those are some of the California regs and, and other parts of, of the region. But maybe sitting there going, well, if I'm not from California, why should I really care? about what's going on and because I don't sell in California, maybe not, I don't do business in California. Well, the reason that you should care is because uh, the U.S. Climate Alliance, because there's lack of federal uh, really leadership on a regulation perspective, HFC regulations, um, there's 25 member states have gotten together and say, hey, there's something that we need to do in it by ourselves because we don't have the federal uh, guidance here at this point in time anyway. And I already mentioned that California here on the top right, the purple, have implemented SNAP Rule 20 and 21 as of 2019. But then there's others that uh, have adopted it. And um, the yellow states, you can see, Seattle and others, and then you've got some more that are in process, the blue ones that are in process. And then you've got others that are currently have no action but are moving towards that. And really what that means is that they're taking matters into their own hands. And about half of the U.S. population make up that. And one of the reasons that they're doing that is because SNAP Rule 20 and 21 is clearly laid out. But the, the problem with that is that you have different implementation dates, um, and that makes it confusing. And some states are trying to do little variations of it. And from an industry, it's, it's very difficult to try to wrap all our arms around it. But it is what we're dealt with at this point in time in dealing with it. 
One point at the bottom of the chart that's interesting, the AIM Act, this is more of a bar, bipartisan bill uh, that's really looking at uh, more of a federal approach to phase down. Instead of this patchwork from the U.S. Climate Alliance, they're proposing more of a, a phase down uh, approach similar to what Kigali is, uh, is doing. And the U.S. is not signed on to Kigali yet, but uh, this may help with uh, HFC reduction targets. When we look at um, a while ago, Emerson really conducted primary research study, and maybe some of you have heard us talk about this before, uh, for supermarket operators, facility engineers, director of maintenances. And, you know, we went through an exhaustive list of questions. And really, the purpose of the questions um, with all these retailers to try to find out what were the factors that were influencing system selection as far as they were concerned. Because we needed to understand really what, what are your pain points and what's important to you as a retailer when you're selecting equipment. So it was interesting because as we started going through these mounds of, of, of answers and paperwork, there were certain things that bubbled up to the surface in every single retail that we talked to, and they became common themes that started to develop. And uh, those common themes, we started calling them the six S's, and maybe you've heard this before, but from the six S perspective, the first one that's interesting is we call it simple. The, and simple does seem to be pretty simple, but from an operator's perspective, seeking to minimize complexities uh, was, a, was a huge one. Keep things simple so they can understand them, they can be diagnosed, and that they're familiar. And also simple tends to equate with reliability. So that was really top of mind for every single one of the responses that we had. The, the other one, of course, is sustainability because we're in this era of regulations and refrigerant regulations. So uh, environmental sustainability, of course, is top of mind. But as we started talking to more retailers, you know, some retailers started saying, well, yes, environmental sustainability is important, but, but so is technical sustainability. I don't want to install something in my stores that will be basically obsolete in a few years. I want to make sure that they're also uh, sustainable from a, from the fact that we can buy those parts going forward. So technically sustainable and, and financially sustainable going forward. So those are, those are points that were very important to them. Um, stability, system stability. And I mentioned simple often equates to reliability and reliability and stable systems are also top of mind. If they really are looking for something that's really high on the list of priorities to have a system that they can rely on um, that's not going to be hyperactive and be full of issues going forward while addressing their environmental needs. So that's a big one. Security, whether it's, whether it's IT security, which is a top of mind for, for all retailers today, and they're very protective of that and should be, of course, but also security of their employees. And we're hearing a lot about that from supermarket retailers right now in the environment that we're in, making sure their employees are safe, are protected, and also the service people that come in and work on their system. So security was important and kept bubbling up in those responses from retailers. And also serviceability, being able to go to the wholesaler and buy the parts that are on their system is huge. And, and service technicians being able to understand what they're walking into when they go into a store so they can troubleshoot it properly, that's a big deal to them as well. And the last thing was taking advantage of the IoT and making our system smarter, making them uh, the ability to leverage IoT from a communication perspective, making sure that our systems are always energy optimized and always working at peak performance and, and, and warning them ahead of time proactively if possible. 
So those are all top of mind uh, subjects as far as the 6S is concerned and we're part of the selection criteria. So what we're going to do right now is a polling question. Um, which of the following six S's are most important to you? So we'll take a 30 seconds here to allow you to fill out this survey. In a few minutes, we're going to show the results of this particular survey. Okay, it just popped up. So uh, based on the survey, it looks like the top item was serviceable at 49%, sustainable at 43 and uh, simple at 33, which is kind of, I just wanted to compare, kind of interesting because in the last week, um, week and a half or so, um, as part of my LinkedIn strategy, I kind of put up the six S's and every couple of days I would throw one up and I would put, I, you know, I've done all of them except for SMART up to now. And when we compare the results there uh, against at least social media, my LinkedIn post, the top ranking one on LinkedIn was simple. Um, the second top ranking one was stable, and the third was serviceable. So it's interesting, I guess, uh, how they compare one to the other. So thank you very much for doing that, and uh, we'll move on to the next. So we've, we've, we've looked at the criteria and um, you know, within that criteria, of course, every individual customer uh, is different. They have different pains, they have different needs, they have different stresses, and they have their own compelling reason to act, to purchase, to select. And, uh, and that may vary from location to location. A, a, a retailer, maybe the same retailer, but in a high ambient area or in an area where the service uh, professionals are different than, than others, then their criteria may be different. And in Emerson, we're, we're looking at how does that impact the decision making from an architecture perspective? How does that impact it from, okay, we're gonna do a retrofit of the store, or we're gonna completely remodel a brownfield store, or we're gonna build a new greenfield store somewhere. But every time you talk to somebody, they have different requirements. Now you may or may not be able to see this, but this is um, an example here of one of these criteria. Now the small text here, we got one, two, three, four, five. So the order of importance in this particular example is high energy, energy use, reducing my energy use is top of mind, super important. I need to meet regulations, so that's my second top priority. Uh, maintenance costs are important to us managing leaks, and at the bottom here we've got data insight. But what's interesting, uh, that specific end user may not have that, so the technician experience is low. Um, the level of technology they require might be basic. Um, they may want HFC or HF, HFO blend because that's what they're used to. They want some data and it's an old store. Uh, so what are we going to do with that? So we look at that and try to find the best solution for that specific uh, operator. Now, again, if it's retrofitting the store, there's certain things we can do. And if it's remodeling that brownfield store, well, there's different options to take. Now, the next customer may look a little bit different in that, in this particular case, meeting regulations top of mind, and also they want natural refrigerants. Okay, well that makes sense. They have high experienced technicians and they want advanced technologies. Well, that screams uh, CO2 technology to me. They want natural, they've got high skilled labor, they want advanced technology. So, so by looking at those different personas and, and walking through customer to customer, it can help us understand different architectures that may be viable or conversations we may want to have with our customers around that. And of course, there are different personas to go through that I'm not going to cover individually. So what I'd like to do today between myself and Diego is take a look at these architectures. I mean, I think we all realize that the majority of systems out there in the install base of supermarket systems 
are centralized HFC racks or HCFC racks um, that have been converted. And those are centralized. Um, they have two, three, four thousand pounds of refrigerant in them. Um, they have thousands of feet of pipe, many, many joints. They've traditionally been the highest leak rate offenders, and that's why a lot of regulators are basically targeting large systems and, and, and looking at that first to try to reduce the direct emissions, um, uh, HFC losses due to direct emissions and greenhouse gas emissions due to direct. So some of the options that have been proposed and are being actively used today in the central space, of course, are CO2 transcritical. And what I've done here with all these diagrams, I've tried to keep them to the commonest, the com lowest common denominator. And when we go to school, we talk about, you know, the basic four components that you need for a mechanical refrigeration system. So that's how I've tried to lay out these schematics. You've got a compressor, you've got a condenser, you have a pressure reducing device expansion valve, and you have an evaporator. So I've, I've tried to keep them as simple as possible. CO2 transcritical, centralized system, low GWP option being used today around the world, uh, pumped CO2 secondary, <clears throat> whether it's all CO2 from a pump perspective or whether it's glycol medium temp CO2 cascade, low temp uh, is an option, and subcritical cascade, of course, um, <clears throat> retail cascade system. Uh, where you're using a lower GWP gas in the medium temp and a CO2 cascade in the low temp. I am not going to cover those architectures today individually. They've been done in the past. It will continue to be done in the, in, in the future. What I want to focus on are decentralized systems as well as micro, as well as distributed systems. So that, that's what I'm going to focus on. So before we get going, we'll take 30 seconds to answer this second polling question, and we will not show the results of this one, and we'll just move on from there. Okay, I think we're going to leave it up, but I'm going to get moving to the next slide. So the first decentralized architecture I want to talk about is um, low charge, just decentralized mini scroll racks. And you know, mini scroller racks have gained a lot of popularity in the last 20 to 25 years due to their, their flexibility and equipment placement. In my, my diagram here on the top right shows, wow, small uh, compressor units sitting on the mezzanine. Another one is sitting next to uh, uh, the doors, maybe at the back somewhere in the store. And then the other one sitting on top of the roof. So location flexibility is, is, is really important. Uh, and because of that, uh, this decentralized architecture, you're able to optimize suction pressures to drive efficiency. So if you've got a plus 20 degree loop, you put them on a twist plus 20, you keep the suction pressure as high as possible, and you keep your energy savings as high as possible. So that's another big advantage. And also, when you compare the charge, you've got in our image here, you've got three separate charges. So if you have a leak, the leak is contained to one of those circuits, not the entire system. So there's certainly advantages there as far as that goes. Um, my little schematic down here, my stick diagram, just represent a multi-scroll compressor rack, individual medium temp, and then a separate individual low temp. And these, these architectures in Canada, of course, are uh, can be used with a GWP limit of 2200 with no charge limit, so that's not a problem. But, but, but what about California, for example? If you can get your charge down to less than 50 pounds, come 2022, that's an option uh, using SNAP-approved uh, 20 and 21, the refrigerants found in the SNAP-approved, which started in 2019. Again, in the U.S. Climate Alliance states that have started to implement some dates, um, again, this architecture can be used in that um, based on these specifically allowed refrigerants. But what's also interesting is that um, under UL 6, 
0335 2-89 there's some there's some work going on right now to try to change um, the standard to include H2Ls as well as A3 and look at different charge limits. Now that's already been done on the commercial AC section, which would be 2-40 UL 60335 2-40. Um, and now we're looking at what can we do in the in the refrigeration standard. And um, at some point we believe that when it standard goes through, it would be, voted, it would be uh, in the next two to three years, would be looked at. There's a potential to go up to 176 pounds of releasable charge, which is about 80 kilograms, uh, with the right mitigation, of course, for mildly flammable refrigerants. But now you'll be able to use, uh, in the future, less than 150 gases in a whatever that charge limit ends up being with the mitigation in this type of architecture. So that's interesting. Um, I talked about optimized suction pressures. Um, you know, some of these smaller racks can have uh, some, some different charge limits, of course. They typically use refrigerants now around 1,300 GWP, or, or those that are available that meet uh, the SNAP regulations. Uh, C stores, small to medium, and even large supermarkets use these. And, and really no specialized training is, is required because it's, it's kind of a known um, entity. So that's one architecture that we're looking at. It's something that is probably <laughs> that, that we've known for a long time, the beauty about your standard outdoor condensing unit is that they're well known. Um, they're easy to work on. They're available from all refrigeration wholesalers that you deal with, and parts are always available for these things. Um, so that's one advantage. The, when you look at smaller loads, um, individual outdoor condensing units make a whole lot of sense. And we also understand that some retailers, there's still a lot of them out there today that still use individual condensing units. There's a lot of them out there on the store. And as an option going forward, it can also be an option to meet some regulations in certain parts of the country. Um, in keeping with the SNAP list of approved refrigerants, and for California, staying under the 50 pounds, and U.S. Climate Alliance following that. But typically, it's one unit per load if there's a single compressor in that condensed unit, that's typically how it's done. Uh, they typically use medium pressure refrigerants for um, low temp and medium temp, but many of these condensing units also are approved for uh, low pressure refrigerants in medium temp use. So that allows you to drive down your GWP in some of the medium temp units. So that's another option to look at. And of course, most of them are approved for your medium pressures with lower GWP applications. I think you all know them. But they also fall under uh, under 3,000 square feet of walk-in cooler or freezer. Um, there's a AWEF, the efficiency standard, um, that started for medium temp, have already been implemented for medium temp units, and now low temp units will, are slated for July of this year. Um, and they're a simple node entity. There's some options there. Now take that a step further, and it, and it starts to open up remodel applications. When you're looking at now, take that a, a condensing unit, standard condensing unit, and add variable capacity to a single unit like that, and now all of a sudden that opens up multiple evaporator use for a single condensing unit with a single compressor. So it gives you a little bit more flexibility in remodels of old facilities. So you may be replacing three smaller condensing units and replacing with one. And if the proximity of the unit is such that you can keep your charge low, then your application start to grow. You can use them in more regions. Uh, and following the guidelines of, of refrigerant allowability, depending on where you are. So it is an excellent remodel option. 
uh, even for the remodels as well as new. Um, it's got great load matching capabilities. And again, the application for small, medium, and click and collect type applications are nice. And click and collect, as you know, can have high variations in load, high heat load during the day with lots of opening and closing, managing that load. But at night, the loads are low. They're not used. The unit's ability to scale down is there. Um, this digital less line happens to be a Copeland one, but it has onboard communication and diagnostics as a benefit. And it also uh, allows you to, to interconnect all of these different units to a larger building automation system. So now you've got connectivity of all your individual units into one main, main area. So that's another option uh, to meet some of these challenges. Taking a look at digital modulation, if you're not too familiar with digital modulation, this is kind of a cutaway here of a digital scroll compressor. And what's unique about it, it has this little cap on the top, and that cap is there to accommodate a piston inside that particular compressor. And there's also a copper tubing that goes to a pulse whip modulated solenoid valve directed to suction. And the way it's done right now is the red is high discharge pressure, builds up on top of the piston, creates a pressure so that contact between the orbiting scroll and the fixed scroll is made, and you have 100% mass flow. When you energize this little solenoid valve and release the pressure on top of the piston, the piston moves up with discharge pressure helps to assist it, pushes up, and then you have about a one millimeter gap between the orbiting scroll and the fixed scroll, and compression stops. So mass flow, um, the, the actual mass flow coming out of that compressor stops, but the inertia continues to move refrigerant throughout. So, and it works on a pulse width modulated cycle, typically 20 seconds. So if I have, if I'm completely 100% duty, it's on all the time. But if I have 75% duty, that solenoid will be energized 75% of that 20 seconds and then off for that 25%. And that's really how it runs. And um, as we, that's pretty much the, the orientation and the functioning of the digital. The last product, the unit that I'm going to talk about is something that basically came out of um, some necessity, I suppose, or need. This architecture really was developed um, to, de to provide options. I talked about three options. This is another option that uh, we've been working on, and we understand that um, we've got CO2 out there, we have ammonia, we have propane, and uh, Emerson investing in all of those technologies and continue to do so. But we also understand that not every customer wants a natural solution today. It doesn't mean they won't tomorrow, uh, but they're more comfortable with known entities using components that they're familiar with. And really what we tried to do here is combine various architectures into one uh, to provide that other option to retailers. So if I just take a look at this skit, uh, stick diagram down here at the bottom, you can see I've got medium temp, which is my green. I've got my condenser, medium temp loads, but I also have a liquid line that comes out and feeds my low temp evaporator. So I have a loop liquid line feeding my medium temp, loop liquid line feeding my low temp, but I have individual compressors located at the case location discharging into the medium temp suction. Now, if we go over here at the schematic on the top right, the light blue box is an outdoor condensing unit, which is my medium temp unit. The blue is my liquid line feeding a cooler, another cooler here, but that line also feeds a freezer. In this dark blue box is a compressor. So the suction goes into the compressor and it discharges into the closest medium temp suction, thereby eliminating the need to discharge all the way out to a separate condenser, keeping the charge low, 
and keeping the, the pressures quite low. Um, so this is another option that again can be below 50 pounds and meet the top two requirements. And as I mentioned before, future uh, potential for A2Ls as well. This architecture has been really leveraging the use of low pressure refrigerants um, for an architecture that can do low temp as well as medium temp with low pressure refrigerants. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the diagrams to come. So the, the circuit, the schematic on the left is your traditional condensing unit I just talked about. The one on the right is micro booster, distributed micro booster, where a condensing unit will have typically two compressors at minimum in here, one being variable capacity. Discharge liquid line here is in blue, feeding a medium temp. The loop liquid line also feeds the low temp. Low temp comes out and now goes into the compressor who discharges into the closest medium temp suction line. And the advantage of that is that we have low compression ratios, low discharge temperatures. Um, instead of having a compressor that discharges uh, at higher disc compression ratios, this one's much less. So if we take the system on the left at a minus 10 saturated suction, and 24 pounds of 404A with 100 degree condensing, there's 211 pounds of lift with a compression ratio of 6.5 to one on the low temp. And incidentally, this changes with ambient. The one on the right never changes because my suction in the micro booster is five pounds for 513A at minus 10, and I'm discharging into a plus 23 suction so that differential is only 18 pounds of lift, and the compression ratio is only 1.9. So regardless if it's 110 degrees outside or minus 20, this lift will always be the same. The heat of compression will always be the same. So that's super important to note, especially if you're in a high ambient area where you've had to deal with um, high compression ratios. I'm running a little behind here. It is my own fault for being so slow at the beginning. Uh, so this is just a simple schematic showing the architecture, a little more uh, organized, if you will, where you have two or three compressors in parallel, medium temp, one digital, discharging into, of course, your outdoor condenser. And you can see that your liquid line in yellow or orange goes into your receiver, electronic valve, medium temp, case, light blue is suction. I've got a walk-in box, light blue suction. There are no EPRs here. There are no solenoid valves here. There are no, nothing to, re, to cause pressure drop, to add extra leak potential and mechanical failure. We're trying to keep a low pressure drop system to increase efficiencies and optimize performance and make sure oil flows, refrigerant flows unrestricted. But the advantage here of the low temp down here is that if you leave this compressor off and you enable the electronic valve, this, is the, this compressor design is that flow can go right through it. So by leaving the compressor off and enabling the low temperature electronic valve, you're working that low temp case in a medium temp set point. So it's in effect a dual temp case. If something happens to that low temp compressor and it gets locked out, you can have your controls architecture to assure that the electronic valve stays enabled, send an alarm, and operate at a medium temp suction temporarily until you get service there. And you can also float the head pressure and do all of the other value drivers that you could out of normal systems. But you reduce your charge, you reduce your piping, and you can use a low pressure gas for both medium and low temp. And we use the low pressure refrigerant because the main advantage is we'll validate the technology as we're still in the validation phase here with a low pressure 513 gas, which has zero glide and a low GWP of 631. But understanding all the technology using a 513 positions us well for the future 
When H2L refrigerants are part of the codes and standards, now we have options in the exact same technology with li very little mitigation to provide a less than 10 GWP option, almost less than one GWP option in the 1234YF, or other refrigerant options like 516A or even a, a low pressure 471A, A1 under 150 gas. So those are all options that we're able to, to look at in the future. And I think this may be my last chart here. It kind of talks, it talks about the performance analysis of the micro booster for 100,000 BTU unit in Atlanta. And it compares different architectures, 404A centralized, 47A distributed, a 47A secondary with glycol medium temp CO2 low temp, a CO2 cascade, a micro booster, and a CO2 transcritical. And the light blue, the dark blue is low temp annual energy. The orange is medium temp annual. And the gray is peak energy uh, comparison from one system to the other. And from a uh, CO2 emissions perspective, um, when we look at direct and indirect impact of various technologies, microbooster fares out very, very well there. And from an embodiment perspective, I've, I've shown little uh, individual cases with compressors on top, low temp, discharging into a larger unit. Or you can have more of a condensing unit C store version or a uh, click and collect type um, operation. And then we also have uh, installation sites for distributed micro boosters. So even though um, we started this back in 2017, in our um, lab, we have systems running in the field. Um, there's some in Ohio. There's actually one, two, there's actually four systems running in Canada since, well, two of them have been running almost two years now. One's been running since April 2018, the other one June 2018, and a couple of the larger systems um, in 2019. So we're looking at scalability potential low GWP potential, and um, we have uh, many, uh, several other sites planned for the, the upcoming year. So uh, sorry for rushing through this last section, but the, I will pass it over to Diego Marifun to talk about the uh, indoor distributed architecture. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Andre, it's always a satisfaction to discuss this topic by your side. And I hope everybody's safe at home uh, during these difficult times. So uh, the, the, your last chart, or the, the, the one before, is a great segue from the, from the micro booster topic into the indoor distributed architecture. As it basically, uh, when we look at the micro booster, you have a, a hybrid between indoor and outdoor um, type of equipment. Now jumping into the indoor distributed, ar distributed architecture, the basic design is that the refrigeration unit, basically the condensing unit, is mounted indoor. So either on top of display cases, using the display case as an example here, or on the bottom of supermarket islands or prep tables, that refrigeration unit is going to be indoor. Uh, it can be propane up to the up to the charge limit uh, allowed, or a refrigerant like a one R448, R449 are two two of the most common ones. Uh, air cooled is an option. Uh, water cooled is another option. The picture that I'm showing here on the screen, and let me see if I can make my pointer work here is basically a store using the water, water cooled version where you see these small blue boxes here representing the refrigeration unit. So in this case, sitting on top of display cases and then the condensing side of those units being chilled by water that is coming through the piping from an external chiller. So basically the heat in those cases uh, is rejected uh, through the water or a mixture of glycol. Uh, one of the main aspects in this case is the low leak uh, rates. So we're talking about sustainable solutions here and 
I like that out of the pooling question, one of the one of the top ranked was uh, sustainability. So in this case, because of the charges localized at the cases or at the equipment level, basically the leak rates and the risks of having a major leak in your system is a lot less. And also, as you can as you can imagine, all this equipment now is modular with less piping, less configuration. So the flexibility and the simplicity uh, comes along with this architecture. We've seen a lot of uh, small and medium-sized supermarkets and and um, food food services spaces now um, deploying this type of architecture in the in the in the recent times. A way, a way to look at uh, end users holistically, and Andrew and I, we like to we like to say that this chart not only applies to distributed architectures or indoor distributed architectures, but to every single architecture. We have it in here just to, to highlight the approach that that not only Emerson but the, the end users have been using in the industry too. When looking at new stores and remodels, to make those stores integrated stores at the commission time, but also maintaining the store over the life cycle of that unit. So basically we have three major or five major pieces that come along over setting up that store, being the first one, the, the equipment, um, usually supplied by OEM that's going to put together all the, all the components, all the technology. But then when you think about the smart and, and integrating that store, you have the second piece, which is the facility controls, usually integrating all those equipments in the floor of, of the store. Also, uh, every, every, uh, every time a new store is being set up, the concern about the project management piece of that store or the certainty around setting up that store on time and in full, and I, when I say in full, is making sure that every piece of equipment is going to be integrated properly and is going to be functional by the time that the store is commissioned, is the third piece that we say, okay, before, before the store is commissioned, you've you got to take, take care of those three, three major pieces and make sure that all the players in that arena, so you have OEMs, you have consultants, you have contractors, you have companies like Emerson that, that can be overseeing all that process, um, looking at the end user as the, as the main target for that process. And then once the store is set up, uh, more and more the enterprise services are becoming popular so that the store is properly monitored and services are dispatched uh, in many occasions ahead of the, the, the break of the equipment. And in the occasion that when equipment breaks, then you have the aftermarket. I think service stability was one of, one of the high-ranked um, topics as well in the pooling question. So having that aftermarket infrastructure supporting the store in the end of the chain is the fifth element that we're looking at and really bringing this holistic approach to make sure that the store is not only properly set up in a smart and integrated way, but also that the life cycle services are going to be provided for that site. One uh, of the examples that Emerson has been working on is the indoor modular solution. And, and I'm basically talking to the picture on the right of your, si of your, of your slide. Um, I have on the left hand, ch hand side the store, basically that same picture that I showed in my first chart, representing the indoor distributed type of architecture. And then uh, if you explode one of those display cases, you basically have the refrigeration equipment sitting on top of the display case. Uh, a very low profile equipment that is important because as the stores become smaller, uh, height becomes a, a big deal. So there, is, there, has, there has been more and more concern about the height and the footprint of those equipments. Um, and, and not only for visual, and, and, but, but, but then connected to the serviceability and to the access to, to that equipment uh, that is all comprised in, in the, the way the equipment is assembled and mounted on the equipment, uh, on the display case in, in, this, in this example. Now, just connecting to, the, to my former chart, in, in some occasions, you're able to make the integration of that uh, refrigeration equipment 
to facility controls in a more seamless way, that's that's a that's a concern that have has been in in the very high rankings nowadays. And then once you have that connectivity at the store level, also being able to remotely access those equipment and, and monitor and manage that equipment is another is another relevant aspect. So that's that's just one example. There are other examples available out there, but that has been increasingly getting more and more attention uh, from from the market. And this is just a closer look. So if I flip back just for a second, so that equipment that I show here sitting on top of a display case, if you take a closer look of the two modules that you saw on the previous chart, you basically have an electronic module. And I'm not going to walk through all the details on this chart, but the electronic modules on the upper side of this chart and on the bottom, the condensing unit, the low-profile condensing unit. And some of the innovations here that I, that I can mention is the low-profile scroll, the horizontal scroll. That's, that has been new to the market since early this year. Uh, it's a variable speed compressor uh, that combined to the electronic module that includes the VFD, so the variable speed drive, to manage the speed of that compressor, along with the, electro the electronic, the programmable control for the case, all connected and balanced with the electronic water valve that is basically controlling the water in to cool that condensing unit, the water-cooled condensing unit, and also managing the electronic expansion valve. So putting it all together, is it's a high-caliber uh, type of equipment combining case control, VFD, EXV, and the water valve for a perfect balance of the, refriger the refrigeration equipment. And with this chart, I basically wrap up the session that is more related to 448, 449. I think I missed to mention that over the presentation. So basically, with 448, 449, not having the charge limits as you have for propane, you can cover basically most of your equip equipment in the indoor distributed architecture as you're keeping that charge very uh, localized at the equipment level. And in those cases, they will vary between one, two, three pounds all the way up to five, six, or seven pounds, but not much more than that. So you're basically a, a lot lower than that 50 pound uh, limit that Andre mentioned earlier in the presentation. Now, uh, still within the indoor distributed architecture, we like to, to have a session specifically to talk about propane. And in that case, we, we, we rename this subsection of the indoor distributed architecture as the micro distributed architecture. And, and basically propane, as you probably, most of you know, uh, propane could be, could be selected or classified as the solution to answer several of the refrigerant regulations if it was not for the several challenges that are listed on the right-hand side of the chart. And, and I can almost synthesize or summarize all of the challenges to the charge limit of 150 grams that we nowadays have in the U.S. Now, there are discussions around that charge limit changing, but until so far, that's the student number. So, so we're sticking to that number for this presentation and keeping an eye for that number uh, potentially increasing in the, in the short term and then allowing us to, to do more in the propane arena. Uh, on the advantage side of propane, if you, if you look from the framework that the E360 brings to the table here, the equipment, the economics, the environment, and the energy all together, that becomes a great refrigerant. And, and just to mention, highly efficient and with a GWP of three, so very low the, in terms of sustainability, great, great um, advantages uh, for low uh, environmental impact. Now, a creative way that some OEMs have been deploying the, the propane solutions, so now doing a parallel to the indoor modular solution that I presented in this section before, so using the same example here of a micro or of a indoor distributed architecture with water cooled condensing units, before I had one unit 
basically providing the cooling load for, for the display case. So using as an example a 12 foot long display case with 448, with propane, in order to keep those charges up to 150 gram of, in each of the circuits, some OEMs have been deploying three circuits in a single case. So basically, that's what we classify as the micro-distributed architecture. So putting the, all, all, the, all the components that you have in, a, in, in the refrigeration circuit three times in that same case so that you can keep the charge the charges of propane up to 150 gram. And then in my last chart, one of the major things about propane is that all the components uh, included in that refriger refrigeration system needs to be propane specific. So uh, Emerson, uh, from our angle, we've been working to expand our portfolio of products for propane. So in this chart, I basically have a summary of all the compressors, uh, vertical scrolls, low profile scrolls, reciprocating compressors, condensing units, controllers, displays, variable speed drives, all the flow controls equipment. And not only that, we've been putting um, significant investment in solution centers across the globe to make sure that we have the proper infrastructure to test and help customers develop propane, propane solutions as regulations make of this a more flexible alternative in the market. And with that, it's precisely 3 p.m. I'm afraid I was not fast enough to allow too many questions. Amanda, how do we do from here on? Yeah, and now for the Q&A section of our event. Um, as a reminder, to participate in the Q&A, uh, type your question into the text area and hit send. Please keep the send to default as all panelists. If we do not answer your question live, we will follow up with you via email after the event. So don't um, think that because we don't have um, much time that we won't get to your question. But um, we do have a time for maybe one question here. Um, the question is, what are the estimated adoption of these architectures with less than 150 GWP refrigerants and natural refrigerants? What are the estimated adoptions of these natural mm -hmm. refrigerants? Correct. Um, well, uh, natural refrigerants are being adopted uh, globally. Um, CO2, as, as if you follow what's going on in Europe, there's you know over 20,000 systems and more. And North America is growing uh, every year. Canada and the U.S. But but that's that's CO2. It's it's taking a large share in the um, in the new uh, supermarket space. Propane as well is continues to grow in that distributed, micro distributed that Diego just talked about. Um, and right now it's in the, in North America anyway, it's 150 gram charge limits. In Europe, the IAC has moved it up to 500 grams so they can do more with that charge from a refrigeration perspective. And Diego also had on his chart that even propane, for example, uh, um, in the, the new codes and standards that I also referenced, we're looking at possibly going up from 150 today to 300, doubling the capacity. Uh, so that'll also help the case for propane in, in getting more applications in the future. Um, Percentage-wise, don't have those exact numbers, but from a popularity perspective, naturals uh, continue to grow. There's no doubt about it. Okay. I don't know if you wanted to add hey. anything, Diego. Yeah, I would. I would just answer that the to complement your answer, Andre. Uh, on the lower than 150 GWP, I think we're still learning how how that area is going to play out. Uh, most of the known natural. In that in that range are HULs, and yes, we, we know about sites already deploying HULs in Europe and in, in other places in the globe. But 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 the U.S. basically building codes are not ready yet to allow that deployment. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I think I think we're going to see more of 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 those smaller than 150 GWP level in the in the years to come. 
Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Andre and Diego. Um, I believe that's all the time we have for questions today. Uh, thank you all for your participation. And as a reminder, a few days after this live event, you can access the presentation on demand at climate.emerson.com slash E360 webinars. And you'll also receive an email in the next few days with a link to the recorded event. On behalf of Emerson, thank you for attending today's E360 webinar. Information and registration will be available soon for our upcoming webinars. We hope you can join us again.